Well, thank you, Colleen. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, it was actually about three or so years ago she tried booking me, and then perfect, thank you. Uh, I was booked the first year, and I said, okay, we'll get it on the schedule. So that was about two years ago we put this on the schedule, and, and it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here in Michigan. I get to Michigan occasionally, but, but not, not real often. Now, the first thing I'm going to do, though, is uh, I'm going to take a picture of you because... <laughs> I have a little. Uh, I have a little thing going with uh, my wife. She says, uh, "My wife has never heard me give a presentation. We've been married 39 years. She tells people, hell, I won't even walk across the street to listen to him, let alone go to a presentation.' So I'm going to send her that picture just so she knows there are really people out there that that do want to hear me. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Colleen and Aaron." and all those at the, at the district for, for bringing me here. I uh, thank you to Pete for sponsoring me, and thank you to Jamie for picking me up and chauffeuring me around. That's a real, real pleasure. It was nice to visit with him uh, yesterday. So I'm gonna just uh, briefly share with you the journey that my family and I have been on the past 25 plus years, and I'm gonna go through it rather quickly. I want to make it perfectly clear. I am not here in any way to tell you how you should or shouldn't run your operation. Only you can determine that. I'm simply here to share with you my story, the story of our ranch, and how we've gotten to the point we are today. So it's really a journey about soil health. And I tell people, uh, when my wife and I purchased the ranch from her parents in 1991, we didn't know where this journey we, we would take us. We didn't have a plan. It's been a learning process all the way. And to me, that's one of the exciting things about agriculture is that you can always learn and you can always change. And I have the good fortune now, I'm literally on hundreds of farms and ranches all over the world every year and no two are alike. Everyone's different, and that's the beauty of it. But we have the ability to learn from that. You know, it's, it's really my good fortune that I get on so many places because I'm able to learn a, a, from each and every one of them, and I'll le certainly learn things today listening to the other speakers. So a little bit about the history of, of our ranch. Our ranch is located actually in the jurisdiction of the city of Bismarck, North Dakota, which is about 125,000 people in that area. My in-laws bought that farm in 1956. It consists of about 5,000 acres. My father-in-law farmed what was considered very conventional, heavy, heavy tillage. He enjoyed tillage, and I'll talk about him. I, I always say that he practices recreational tillage. He would go out just for the sake of tilling because he enjoyed doing that. Half summer follow, half crop, all small grains. He used fertilizers, pesticides, occasionally a fungicide use. Organic matter levels, when my wife and I bought the farm from them in 1991, on the cropland were 1.7 to 1.9%. Now that's significant because historically speaking, soil scientists tell us that that cropland in central North Dakota should have been in the 7 to 8% range. So in other words, we had lost over 75% of the carbon in the soils due to management practices. Also in 1991, I had good fortune, Jay Fear, who many of you have probably seen YouTube videos of or heard present, came out and he did some baseline soils work. And he found that we could only infiltrate a half of an inch of rainfall per hour. So that's not very much. Now we only get about 16 inches of total precip. About 12 inches falls as rain, and then the rest is from the 70 plus inches of snow we tend to get. The grazing system, there was three pastures. They put cattle in season long, and then they were run on crop aftermath a little bit, and then fed for approximately six months out of the year. Calved in corrals, you know, that, that was just common, and the animals were confined. Well, I had the good fortune that I wasn't uh, I didn't grow up on a farm. My parents didn't farm. I grew up in town. So everything was new to me. 
And I'd read about no-till, and I had a good friend of mine who was a no-tiller. And he said, Gabe, you just got to do this. It makes sense. So in 1994, the spring of 94, I sold all of my tillage equipment, went 100% no-till. And we've been 100% zero-till ever since. That's the original drill that I bought. 1994, we also added peas to the rotation. You know, my father-in-law was, was spring wheat, a little bit of barley, a little bit of oats. That's it. I added peas because I'd read enough to know you got to have legumes, fix some nitrogen. That fall, following the peas, I went in with winter triticale and hairy vetch. And this was a combination I just thought may work for my environment. I was trying to figure ways to diversify the crop rotation and take advantage of the synergies of nature. You know, why do we as farmers insist on purchasing our nitrogen when, you know, all you have to do is, is plant legumes or provide the home and habitat for the nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the soil? That's what we need to do, but we tend to not do that. Instead, we tend to purchase our inputs. Well, that was the reason I went with the hairy vetch. It's another legume in the system, another way to get nitrogen naturally rather than writing a check for it. So 1995 came along. I had over 1,000 acres of spring wheat in. The day before I was going to start harvesting that spring wheat, we lost 100% of our crop to hail. Now, I never had any hail insurance at the time. My father-in-law had been there uh, 35 years. He had, had had hail twice but never to any great extent. So we just didn't think it was a wise decision. Well, I learned differently. 1996 came along that spring, I added corn to the rotation. I was trying to diversify a little bit. No-tilled the corn into that hailed out wheat stubble. Unfortunately, we lost 100% of our crop to hail again. So two years of zero crop income, things were getting kind of tough. Banker was kind of squeezing me a bit. And I had to learn, okay, how, how am I going to make this work? My wife and I both took off farm jobs to try and, try and make the payments. 1997 came along and we dried out. There was nobody in our area who combined an acre back then. So I was three years of no crop income. And it was at that time that I heard Don Campbell speak, as Colleen said, and he made the statement, if you want to make small changes, change the way you do things. If you want to make major changes, change the way you see things. And I knew then and there that was the answer. I will never, ever forget him saying that. That was life-changing to me, that statement. And I knew I had to observe and figure out, okay, banker's not going to loan me any money anymore. How am I going to make this work without having to sell the farm? Well, 1998 came along, and that's actually a photo I took that evening, and you can guess what that led to. <laughs> so that happened in June. We lost 80% of our crop to hail. So then things were really, really getting tough. But what do you do right after a hailstorm? I didn't have feed for livestock, so I went in, scraped enough money together. I planted cowpeas and sedan grass, legume and a grass, a pretty simple mix. But I was trying to grow something to feed the livestock. Now, truth be told, my intention was to put this up for forage as baled hay. But I literally did not have enough money to pay for the twine and the expense of baling it. So we turned our cattle in there in the winter and grazed them. That was the start of winter grazing. And it was also a real start of getting animals back out onto the landscape, particularly the, the cropland. Now think of what happened. So I had four years, I'd already gone no-till. We had three years due to the hail had, had put a tremendous amount of residue or armor on that soil surface. We didn't disturb that, biology started feeding on that. We were doing soil tests every year and we noticed organic matter levels were starting to rise significantly. We also started integrating the cattle. That was another step to this process. I really realized that what I was doing was I was taking the dirt that we started with and we were starting to grow soil. And that's really what it's about. Now, I'm blessed I have 2,000 acres on our ranch that is what we consider native prairie. In other words, it's, to our knowledge, it's never been tilled. It's pretty impossible to till it. It's up, down, a lot of rocks. 
I spent a lot of time as I was out moving my livestock observing what you see on native prairie. And what we noticed was that nature acts in a certain way. And as I travel around the world, I see this as a constant. Nature always acts in context. And I'm going to talk more about these coming up. There's no mechanical and there's limited chemical disturbance in nature. Plants put off chemicals all the time, but we're not putting the copious amounts of chemicals. Uh, nature isn't putting the copious amounts of chemicals on that as compared to what plants do. Nature always tries to armor the soil surface. You know, if you go out there and till a field, why do weeds appear and come? Nature is trying to armor the soil. She wants to protect the soil, protect it from wind erosion, water erosion, evaporation. Nature cycles water very, very efficiently. Well, I'd mentioned that when we started, we could only infiltrate a half of an inch of rainfall per hour. That's not very efficient. That's on our cropland. But then you go on native prairie, we can have a two inch rainstorm and it'll infiltrate. Why the difference? Because of our management. In nature, there's living plant root networks. There's mycorrhizal fungi moving these nutrients and moisture throughout the soil profile. We've lost that due to our management. Nature cycles nutrients via biology. And this is the hardest one for us as farmers and ranchers to understand. You know, one of the worst things that ever happened in farming and ranching was World War II, where they took the minute after World War II, they took the munitions plants and converted them to produce synthetic fertility. So it became cheap for us to buy that, but as we're seeing 70, 80 years later, that's coming at a great cost to our ecosystem. And then the other thing is nature, there's thousands and thousands of years of research and development. It's hubris of man to think that he can impose his will on nature. You know, nature knows what she's doing. It will always win every time. So these principles, the first is context. And I know many of you are familiar with the five principles of soil health. My business partners and I added this sixth principle, context, because there's, there's many of us who are farming and ranching out of context. You look at your environmental context. Where are you at environmentally? Only certain species grow there, yet it seems we're trying to impose our will and get species to grow in an area where it's not. Ecological context is different on every single farm or ranch. You might have different soil types as compared to your neighbors. You know, you definitely have different precipitation as compared to, to those in other areas, correct? So there's an environmental context we need to look at. There's financial context. How much capital do you have? For the past 25 years, my wife and I have ran an intern program on our ranch where we bring interns in and uh, they help through the summer and they get an education as a part of that. Every intern pretty much that comes, the first thing they want to do is run out and buy land. That's exactly the wrong thing for somebody starting out in farming and ranching to do. We have different financial context. Don't do that. You grow your operation till such a time you can afford to pay cash for a good part of that land. Then you purchase it. There's community context. Everything family through society. How many family members are involved? What type of community do you have? Because that'll play a role in how you farm and ranch. And then I really believe there's a spiritual context. You know, those of us involved in farming and ranching know that faith plays a great part in that. You know, we work with life and death every day in our business. You have to have that spiritual context in order to succeed. Understand that it's different for every single one. So back that after uh, my wife and I purchased the ranch from her parents, I started a purebred cattle operation. I started calving in January and February in North Dakota. That is out of context. You know, and I'm ashamed to say I did that for 25 years. That is out of context. Now we, we have in context. You know, my son took this picture right uh, when he got out of college, moved back to the ranch. 
and he took this picture to show all his college buddies this is how calving should be. You know, we now calve in late May and June out on grass the way it should be. Much more enjoyable, the animals like it, much less stress on, on us. That's ranching in context with our environment. I was not doing that before. The second principle, least amount of mechanical and chemical disturbance possible. So this is my father-in-law. My father-in-law loved tillage so much that when he retired, he went and bought this disc, and he went and disc for neighbors, just for recreation, you know? Well, there was a lot of angst in the family when I went no-till in 1994. My father-in-law, it's a good thing he loved his daughter or I would have been gone. He did not like that. Now, he thought he had the last laugh because when he passed away, guess what I got in his will? <laughs> That's a true story, you know? And that disc lasted less than a week before it was sold, okay? Yeah. This is us today. That's a picture of me planting corn into residue. Notice I don't even use trash whippers. That's way too much tillage for me. We're planting through three to four inches of residue. That's what I want to do. How much, how many weeds are going to germinate there? Okay, how much soil am I going to lose to wind erosion, water erosion? How much moisture am I going to lose to evaporation? Okay, I'm farming in context. It wasn't uncommon for us to have a lot of pest pressure back when we were uh, growing monocultures. Okay, well, what would we do? We'd call, you know, airplane, local co-op, get them to spray on some pesticides, right? Now I met Jonathan Lundgren, and Jonathan Lundgren told me this, and I'll never forget it. He said, Gabe, for every insect species that's a pest, there's 1,700 that are beneficial. So what are we really doing when we spray that pesticide? Aren't we also eliminating all those beneficials? Why do we want to do that? Why do I want to write a check when nature can take care of it for me? The key I found was that I had to provide a home and habitat for those beneficials. How many of us on our farms and ranches really do that? Really provide the home and habitat for all those beneficials, right? We need to start thinking about that. We need to do that. The other thing, you know, I had to use the latest and greatest. Okay, we gotta put seed treatment on our seed, right? Got to put neonicotinoids on there, right? In order to kill those pests. But what did we see after time? We've seen a decline in the insect diversity, especially the pollinator species. Those pollinators are the same insects we need to pollinate our crops. Why do we want to do that? Also, that insecticide is killing below ground biology. There's more microorganisms in a teaspoonful of healthy soil than there are people on this planet. Yet how many of us as farmers and ranchers think about that? You know, there's way more life below ground than there is above ground. Are we doing what's necessary to ensure that that below ground biology, the same biology that cycles the nutrients for us, has a chance? To proliferate and live. How many of you have heard of Rhizophagy? Okay, we've got a few, that's good. So Dr. James White at Rutgers University, I strongly encourage you to Google his name, there's several YouTube videos out there. He has discovered that biology actually interacts with plants a lot differently than we thought. This photo here, drawing, depicts the root tip of a plant. Dr. White has found that microbes actually enter in to that root of that plant. Once they are inside the root of the plant, they shed their outer cell walls, and then the nutrients in the biology are absorbed by the plant. Then they move up the root to the root hairs and are expelled out into the soil. This is actually the picture of a root hair on a plant. 
That's all microorganisms here, these small dots being expelled back out into the soil to go gather more nutrients. Once they do, they come up again. That's the nutrient cycle. Yet what are we doing by applying these seed treatments? We're killing all this biology that cycles the nutrients. Now, if that isn't mind-blowing enough, what Dr. White has also discovered that during the reproductive phase of the plant, that biology moves up through the plant onto the seed, and it's there on the seed, so when that seed falls on the ground or is harvested and, and seeded, that biology is there to start the process all over again. Yet what are we doing in our infinite wisdom in ag? Are we not treating that seed? Killing the very biology that make this cycle happen? That put more dollars in our pocket? And then we in farming and ranching, what happens? We're stretched thinner and thinner with narrower and narrower margins, right? Why not work with nature instead of against her? Third principle, armor on the soil surface. One of the things that, that now is the most disheartening to me is as I travel around the world, I see a lot of areas that look like this. This is the Central Valley of California. Ray Archuleta and I were out there doing some workshops. That's where most of the produce that's grown in the United States, a lot of it is grown, is in that valley. Yet, what do, what do we see? Bare ground, bare ground, bare ground, between every crop, multiple tillage. What's feeding that soil life? What's taking all those nutrients out of the atmosphere and putting it into the soil? There's nothing there until that cash crop's growing, right? How much of that is prone to wind erosion, water erosion? Where do the nutrients end up? In the watershed, right? It's not only through tillage, though. It's also through our management. If, like me, you're in cowboy country, everything that can be baled or put up for forage is, and it's removed. We're removing all that biomass from the soil surface. I needed to get away from that. So I've gone to the point now, this is what I, this field is actually seeded, okay? That's what my fields look like after we're done seeding. How much soil am I gonna lose to wind erosion, water erosion? And now we're also planting green. Now, where I'm at in North Dakota, there's, you know, we, we only have about 110 frost-free days. So I'm very limited in time. I can't get this right hand thesis where rolling will work, so we seed green into it and then terminate the rye with a herbicide. But I have a living plant in the soil as long as possible. And it's not only for crop farming, for grazing also. I travel around to too many places where I see overgrazed pastures. And that's all due to a lack of proper management. This is one of my native pastures. I took this photo uh, last year uh, after we had grazed it and it had recovered. So our rangeland and pasture land is grazed approximately one day every 12 to 14 months. In my environment, with my limited moisture, it takes that long for those plants to fully recover. Your context is gonna be different. You get more moisture, you can graze more often. But the fact is we're grazing way too often, many producers, then they do not have that armor on the soil surface. Very, very key and important to a healthy ecosystem. Fourth principle is diversity. This is one of our native paddocks. If you look at that paddock, you see a tremendous amount of diversity. I tell people, I bought this land in 2003. I bought it for two reasons. Number one, tremendous amount of diversity in a native ecosystem. Number two, with that amount of rocks, I'd never be tempted to till it, right? <laughs> for five years, my son taught rangeland management at the local community college. He brought his students out to this paddock, and in two hours' time, they collected over 140 different species 
of grasses, forbs, and legumes. That's the type of diversity that nature dictates works best. Yet what are we doing in production agriculture today? It's all about monocultures, right? When I started, my father-in-law was strict monoculture, cash crops, spring wheat, oats, barley, the haylands that we had, monoculture alfalfa, monoculture, monoculture. I started to diversify. This is uh, uh, hairy vetch, winter triticale, and cereal rye. Now I've added to that, we're also growing yellow blossom sweet clover and winter barley. I'm developing a winter barley variety that'll overwinter in North Dakota. Been successful two years in a row. Now I'm getting diversity into that mix. We can do that. This is corn with multi-species covers grown between the rows. Many producers are doing that. You're seeing that here in Michigan too. And then the diversity in our pastures. Why don't we want it? See, I had to put this photo in for you guys. It shows that I do have a tree there in North Dakota. <laughs> just, just one, yeah. yeah. When the wind blows, there's a lot of cattle stacked behind there. But. Fifth principle, living root in the soil as long as possible. If farmers could do one thing that would really change their operation, besides eliminating tillage, it'd be this one. We have to have a living root in the soil as long as possible throughout the year. Never, ever pass up the opportunity to cycle carbon. Okay? What, what, what uh, crop you grow here? Just shout out. What's one crop you grow here? Corn and soybeans. Corn and soybeans. Yeah, they're growing everywhere. Okay? If you take a corn plant, soybean plant, cut them off, dry them out, what's left? What's that comprised of? 97% of what's left will be approximately, will be carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. What do those four elements have in common? Carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen. They're all found in the air, right? So 97% of what your plants need I don't care whether we're talking tomatoes, blueberries, corn, soybeans. It comes from the air. Do we ever think about that? <clears throat> Yet what are we doing? We think we have to feed it all those things, right? How do we take that out of the air, put it into the soil? Right here. Living plants. Yet how many farmers are doing that? Okay. What this picture depicts this field up front, this was a cereal rye, winter triticale, hairy vetch field that I combined. That's my most profitable cash crop year in and year out. I immediately then, the next day I was in there with bin run oats, barley, peas, and two pounds of daikon radish. <coughs> now I could graze this if I so chose. It's there though, just to cycle those elements out of the atmosphere and put them into the soil to fuel the next year's cash crop. Why do we insist on doing things the hard way? Why not let nature do it for us? And people say, oh, that's too expensive. Really? Take a little one field of yours, grow some peas and some oats together, combine it, and you've got enough seed for to last you for years, right? Buy two pounds of daikon radish, throw in there, just as a nitrogen sink. And you're starting the process. This isn't rocket science, okay? <coughs> also, we added the very, very diverse covers into our system. They're an important part of the system now because we're optimizing solar energy collection. How many different leaf sizes and shapes do you see there? Is any sunlight that falls on that field, is it going to hit the soil or is it going to hit a leaf? It's going to hit a leaf. If it hits a leaf, photosynthesis is going to occur. And I'm going to take those elements and put them into the soil. Sixth principle, livestock integration. And I know this is difficult. We work with clients, too, that do not integrate livestock. But 
as often as possible, we're going to try and do that. Today, I can drive for hundreds of miles and not even see a fence. We've removed the livestock from the landscape and put them into confinement. And then we wonder why the urban public is so upset with us. Yeah, if we don't pay attention, they're going to start dictating through legislation what we do. We need to get livestock out of confinement and back out on the land. Now on our place, we integrate livestock and we grass finish animals. So this particular field, this was a fall seeded biennial, a winter triticale, winter wheat, hairy vetch, sweet clover, forage winter wheat, all seeded in the fall. We grazed that off, went in immediately with a warm season mix, and now we're grazing it with grass finishers. So we've added double crop cover crops into our cropping rotation. The energy and nutrients that this is accumulating plus what falls out of the back end of the livestock, will fuel the next year's cash crop. We can grow extremely profitable cash crops following this with zero synthetic inputs. We can also use those covers, if we don't graze them during the growing season, to, to graze livestock on during the winter. We've integrated pasture pork. We finish hogs now out on pasture. We've got 1,400 land hands out on pasture. We've got a flock of sheep. We've diversified, integrated as much livestock as possible. The result of that, after 20 years, we've taken soil like this and grown. We've taken dirt like this and grown soil like this. That's the difference. Take a look at these three soil pads here, OK? One of these pads was from a farmer who practiced very little diversity. He primarily only grew two different cash crops, no cover crops, tillage. Another one of the pads was from a farmer who very diverse crop rotation, 10 different cash crops, cover crops between each, but he used tillage. The third ped was taken from the edge of a field. No management, driven over by by equipment, occasionally grazed by some wildlife. Which pet is which? Yeah, the top pet obviously is the end of the field. The middle pet is from the farmer with the diverse rotation and tillage. This bottom pet is from the farmer with no diversity and tillage. Now you might say, yeah, Gabe, that makes sense, but would you believe these are all collected within 100 feet of each other and they're all the same soil type? Management makes the difference. We can take that soil and destroy it to that, but we can also regenerate our soils from this back to better than that. And that's what I was proven here. Can be done. And we can do this anywhere. You know, as I travel around, I hear over and over again, but Gabe, you don't understand. My soil's sandy. You don't understand. My soil's heavy clay. You don't understand. I get too much moisture. Do you understand we can do that? I'm not 99% confident that these principles will work anywhere in the world where there's dry land production, agriculture. I'm 100% confident. If you don't believe me, I will bet you, your farm against mine, that I can do it on your farm. Come on, take me up on it. Okay. I'm waiting for that bet. I'm going to own another farm, I'll guarantee you. Because they're the principles of nature, they work anywhere. The tools we use, as Colleen said, are different. You're not going to grow the same crops that Gabe grows in North Dakota. You're not going to run the same species of livestock. You may not use the same brand of equipment. That doesn't matter, the principles are the same. Understand the principles, implement those principles, and here's what will happen. Now, one of the benefits of having a big mouth and traveling all over is I get a lot of scientists who want to come to my place to do research. Okay, We have an open door policy on our ranch. Anyone can drive up our driveway at any time and look at anything they want. My wife does not like that policy too much at times. Last summer, we had 2,640 people drive up our driveway that we were aware of. Okay, There's others that come you know, when we're not home. But so be it. I want to be an open book and show people. 
I have nothing to hide. I would rather they come and see, and if we're home, we'll explain it to them, than somebody else dictate what's being done on our farm or ranch. So I get these scientists who want to come and do research. Now, I invite them, and usually they come and show up and they say, okay, Gabe, I need you to till here. You got to plant a monoculture here. And I said, no. If you're going to do research on my ranch, you're going to do it on my management scenario. I'm not going to go till one of my fields that's been no-till for 25 years just to appease you. Can't be done. Well, they get mad. They say there's too many variables to quantify, and they leave. But there's a growing number of researchers who are truly looking at ecology and the interaction of all these things. A few years ago, we had the good fortune. One of these scientists came with his research team, and they wanted to see the difference management made in soil function. So they looked at four producers, very close proximity, same soil types, okay? In other words, it was me and three of my neighbors, unbeknownst to a few of the neighbors, but that's another story, okay? So producer A uses tillage, but has a high amount of diversity. They grow a wide array of different cash crops, very, very diverse rotation. They do not use any synthetic amendments but they do use organic soil amendments, such as fish meal, rock phosphate, chicken litter, etc. Now real cover crops, except for alfalfa and sweet clover, which are occasionally plowed down, no livestock integration. So this producer had sunflowers growing that year. What do we see? We see the capping, that crust on the soil surface. That's indicative of a tilled field. Once it dries out, you'll always have that crust. That's going to inhibit right, moisture from entering. It also is going to warm up the surface, and, and you're going to have very high soil temps. You see the horizontal breaking down here where those tillage layers were. Now, they actually, the scientists did biodiversity studies. They found a tremendous amount of above-ground biodiversity. By that, I mean insects, birds, etc. They did not find a large amount of below ground biodiversity and that of course is due to the tillage. The next producer, 10 years, they had been in no till but low diversity. The 30 years prior to that, this producer only grew two crops, spring wheat and flax. It's the only two crops they grew. They have since added a little bit of soybeans to the rotation. But that's his rotation. Use of anhydrous ammonia, no phosphate had been applied in the past 30 plus years to this farm. They do use insecticides and fungicides, no cover crops, no livestock integration. Now the year the, the researchers were there, they had planted this particular field to spring wheat. May 22nd on that year, we had three and a half inches of rain in 45 minutes, washed his entire spring wheat crop away, and he had to plant sunflowers. Okay, this is 10 years no-till. Look at this photo here. Now go back. This is the tilled operation. You'd swear that was the same field, right? You see that capping on the soil surface? You still see horizontal breaking. Even though they're no-tillers, they're using points to inject the anhydrous. That's why you get this horizontal breaking. Very little above-ground biodiversity as far as insects and birds. Very little below ground biodiversity. We didn't notice any earthworms or other macroorganisms. The third producer, 20 years, no till. Medium diversity, but high input type system. This producer grows corn, sunflowers, barley, soybeans, spring wheat, tremendous amount of inputs. They're going to put it on. There's going to be seed treatment on all the seed, there's going to be both dry fertilizer and liquid. Uh, both pre and post, insecticides, fungicides are used, no cover crops, no livestock integration. Look at that soil there. This surprised the researchers more than anything else. Look at that, that's like a brick, okay? We'll get to why in a few minutes. Look at those roots of those sunflowers. They move down, hit a hard pan, move horizontally. They can't even penetrate through it that's so hard. No above ground biodiversity, minimal below ground biodiversity. The fourth producer is myself. 
or 26 years no-till. We grow a wide variety of different cash crops. Occasional herbicide. Now, since this was done, I, most of my cropland now is seven years with no synthetics of any kind. So I could easily be certified organic if I wanted to. No glyphosate. We haven't used glyphosate for many, many years. We try and get a cover crop growing on every cropland field every year, either before the cash crop, along with it, or following a cash crop. But we're going to have living plants as long as possible throughout the year. And then we integrate as much livestock as we can onto the cropland. And that's what our soils look like. And yes, I made sure it was a really nice picture. So, you know, okay. A little bit of difference though, right? The amazing thing, and I tell people, if I had one regret in going down this journey, I wish I would have had the foresight to archive my soils. But I had no idea the path God was gonna take me on back when he sent me those hail, <laughs> that hail and drought. So I hadn't done that. So the best I can do is go to my neighbors and use that as a template. Now, as part of this study, the scientists looked at the uh, analysis, soil analysis, as far as nutrients. I want to explain one term before I go any further, and that's water extractable organic carbon. I don't know if you've heard of that. Your agronomist better be talking to you about it if they're a decent agronomist. Think of it this way, organic matter is the house where biology lives. Water extractable organic carbon is the food, it's the refrigerator in that house because it's what biology eats. One of the real issues we have today is that 95 plus percent of the soil tests being taken out there, it's probably closer to 98%, are fairly meaningless. They only give you a snapshot of the inorganic fraction of nutrients that are available the day that test was taken. They don't tell you how much food's in the system, okay? And then how much total, both inorganic and organic nutrients you have that will cycle via biology. So here's the analysis from these four farms. This is pounds of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, okay? I want you to look at the top three, the other producers here. Obviously, the producer that uses the most tillage has the least amount of nitrogen because it's going to volatilize and be released during that tillage practice. But look at that. There really isn't much difference between those two. Okay? And then you look at mine. Now, what I haven't told you is I have not applied a single pound of either synthetic or organic amendments since 2007. Okay? Yet, look at what I've got for nutrients. People told me for years, yes, Gabe, you can plant legumes and you can get nitrogen, but you're going to run out of phosphorus and potassium. Really? Then why do my numbers keep going up? And we are not applying manure except what falls out of the animals as they graze or run out there. Okay? So where's it coming from? What's holding back this first producer from getting these numbers? Now, I should step back a moment and make this clear. Thank you. My neighbors have every bit as much nutrients as I do in their soil. Here's what they don't have. Water extractable organic carbon, the food that biology eats. Look at that. I got over four times. Doesn't matter their scenario, their farming style, their stewardship practices. They don't have the food. Remember I said green living plants taking all those nutrients out of the atmosphere, pumping them into the soil? It's biology that's the difference. So what's holding back the first producer? Tillage, obviously, right? Remember that producer had a diverse rotation. Excess tillage is destroying this. What's holding back this second producer? Lack of diversity. Plants have the ability to send out root exudates to attract biology to cycle different nutrients, bring those nutrients to them. If you don't have diversity, how's the plant going to get the nutrients it needs? Third producer, high, high use of synthetics. Remember this soil? Oops. Right there. What's happening here? 
Okay, he's using such high inputs, all soil breaks down to about 11 to 1, 11 parts carbon, 1 part nitrogen. He's applying so much synthetic, he's feeding that biology all that nitrogen, the biology's going to go, okay, for every 1 part nitrogen, I need 11 parts carbon. It's destroying eating all the carbon in the soil aggregate, and you're getting these compressed soils, right? It's all management that's making that. You give me management of any of these three farms, give me 10 years, I'll get you numbers like that. It's strictly management. That's how come I can stand here and be so confident I can do that anywhere. And we'll talk more about that. Okay, how about organic matter? Look at those neighbors, 1.5 to 1.7. Remember when I told the history of our ranch? We were at 1.7. Today, my cropland fields are from 5.3 to 7.9. Most of you in this area have higher organic matter levels. You once had really high organic matter levels because you were more fungal dominant. You were a forested area. But look at that. Each one of these producers has something holding them back from advancing the carbon that they have in the system. Rainfall, infiltrations per hour. Remember, I told you Jay Fear tested half of an inch per hour. Look where my neighbors are at. That tells us in that area of North Dakota, you're going to level off at those numbers. Okay? I'll show you coming up what we can do now. And people say, yeah, Gabe, but how fast can you do that? This is Michael Thompson in western Kansas. Fairly dry environment. Three years. That's his soil. He's changed it in three years' time. Are you working with nature or against her? That's, each of you has to decide on your own. Ask yourself that question. Take a look at those principles. They're constant everywhere. You go on your farm or ranch, these principles are there. One of the things I really had to realize is this. My farm is a direct reflection of me. So if you come to Gabe Brown and say, but Gabe, you don't understand, I'm not going to feel sorry for you one bit. Because your farm or ranch is a direct reflection of you. It can be what you want it to be. Your management, your stewardship, determines that. So take a look at your farm or ranch. What issues do you have on it, if you're in Michigan or wherever you're from? Do you see a lot of weeds? Do you see pests? Does drought seem to be a problem? For many of you, flooding is a problem, right? How about do you have salinity issues? That's becoming a greater and greater problem across the upper Midwest. How about poor fertility? Are you having to put on more and more inputs to get the same yield? How about this, compaction? I hear it all the time. Got to go till because I got compaction. Every one of these is a symptom of a larger problem. That's all they are is symptoms. They're trying to tell you something. That problem is a lack of diverse living plants. We can't grow soil we can't stimulate healthy soil without living plants. Ray Archuleta said it best when he said, plant and soil are one. You can't have healthy soil without living plants. Dr. Christine Jones dubbed it the liquid carbon pathway. Plants take in CO2 out of the atmosphere, photosynthesis occurs, it's converted to amino acids and all these other compounds that she calls liquid carbon. Part of that is used by the plant for growth. Part of that is translocated to the roots where it's exuded into the soil. That's the root tip of a plant exuding out those carbon compounds out into the soil. And why does it do that? To feed biology. It's attracting soil biology. Take a look at that critter. Look at the happy lines on that thing. That's a healthy, that's a water bear. Yeah, that's called a water bear. Yep. Soil is a subaquatic ecosystem. 
Biology lives in and on thin films of water in that pore space between soil aggregates. If you don't have soil aggregates, you're not going to have the biology. Then this critter is going to start the rhizophagy cycle, moving that biology into the soil what, and into the plant. So what happens? Bacteria eat those carbon compounds. Then these are protozoa. They're trapping bacteria around this air bubble, consuming the bacteria. When they do that, protozoa have a carbon-nitrogen ratio of approximately 30 to 1. Bacteria is 5 to 1. So they got to eat five bacteria to get the, the, the nitrogen it needs, get the carbon it needs, excuse me, and then what happens? They excrete all the excess nitrogen. That starts the nitrogen cycle. Now, part of that is consumed by biology. Part of those root exudates, those carbon compounds, combine with water to form a mild form of carbonic acid. And it's that mild acid that start breaking down rocks, organic matter, etc. Okay? This makes nutrients available. We've all driven through the mountain and we've seen this, right? Through the mountains and seen a tree growing out of a rock. How did that get there? Is there a pocket of soil in that rock? No. Here, Ray and I are in Mexico, Chihuahuan Desert. Those are grass plants. This is sheer rock here. Those are grass plants growing out of a rock. Seedling lands on the rock. It's moist long enough for it to germinate. Starts to photosynthesize. Excretes those compounds. Those compounds combine with water and start breaking down that parent material. So now go back to what I just talked about before. How I have increased the level of nutrients. I shouldn't say I've increased the level of nutrients. The level of nutrients is going to be static. I've increased the availability of those nutrients. People say, oh, Gabe, you're going to run out of it. Really? I'm going to farm it all the way to China. How many billions of years is that going to take? Right? I'll never run out of nutrients. Millions of years, we're not going to run out. This is the reason why. That's the reason I can have those nutrients cycling and have profitable crop production is because of this. We must have living plants to grow healthy soil. You have to have that. So, could the symptoms that we see on our own farm and ranch be a result of our management? Let's take a look. If you have a lot of weeds, what is that telling you? Weeds are an early succession plant. They grow because of our management or lack thereof. Weeds like a bacterial dominant system. How many of you have done PLFA tests on your soils? You need to fire your agronomist and get them to do it. PLFA stands for phospholipid fatty acid. All living organisms have phospholipid fatty acid. You take a test of your soil, it can determine how much bacteria do you have, how much fungi do you have, how many nematodes, and the vast majority of nematodes are good, by the way, Okay, how many protozoa? What's the bacterial to fungal component ratio of the soil? We want it to be pretty close to one to one. Okay, this is typical of what we see tested. 2,243 bacteria, 205 fungal. 10 to one, the other way. And people wonder why they have weeds. That's the reason. Okay, we need to get this number much, much higher that number can stay where it's at, but we need to get this much, much higher. So how do we do that? I was really blessed on my journey that I met a lot of the right people at the right time. In 2003, Dr. Chris Nichols came to my ranch. She's one of the world's foremost authorities on mycorrhizal fungi. She told me, Gabe, your soils will never become sustainable as long as high rates of synthetics are used. So I said, really? She said, you need to back off because as long as you're feeding that, the biology is just going to consume the synthetics and it's never going to get in the proper balance and it's never going to start cycling the nutrients it needs on its own. So from 2004 through 2007, I did split trials. Would fertilize a field at various rates, 
then we'd have a zero check strip. All four years, the most profitable. Notice I did not say the highest yielding. I get sick of these people talking about yield. We need to be talking about profit. Yield doesn't do us any good if it's not profitable. The most profitable crop was the one where I didn't apply any. So we eliminated all of our synthetic fertility in our, on our own land in 2008 and on our rented land in 2010. When I did that, I noticed an immediate improvement in the aggregation of our soil. Now, I want to caution you, I am in no way standing here to tell you to remove your synthetics. You do that, chances are you'll have a wreck and then I'll be getting a phone call from you, okay? Which, it's fine, you know, I get several hundred a day, it's, it's fine. <laughs> Not because people are mad, just because they're asking questions. You have to do this judiciously, use the proper soil testing, where are you at in your system, and then you start weaning yourself back. I'm not going to stand here and tell every one of you you'll re eliminate all your synthetics. That may or may not fit your context. All I'm concerned about is can we do it in a way that's good for the environment while adding more profit to your bottom line. So what happened when I removed the synthetics, remember I showed you that neighbor's soil and I talked about his high use of synthetics, that the biology then was eating the carbon in the soil, we noticed more aggregation. This is a photo of a millet root. This is the formation of new soil aggregates. A soil aggregate will only last approximately four weeks, and then it's going to be broken down. You've got to form new ones. If you don't have the biology, the mycorrhizal fungi secreting glomalin, you're not going to start putting these sand, silt, and clay particles together and forming new soil aggregates. You don't form new soil aggregates, you got no nutrient cycling, right? Then you, the, the whole thing just crashes. You can't infiltrate water, your soils become like a brick, and then you're saying, oh, I have to go till. Tillage isn't the answer, this is the answer. You do this, and you can end up with soil like that. So how are you going to increase mycorrhizal fungi? Reduce chemicals, Reduce tillage, reduce for tit, not only synthetic fertilizer, the same can be said when we use a lot of uh, manures out of a confinement type system, that's too much nitrogen in the system, we got to be careful with that also. Living plant cover as long as possible throughout the year. What about drought? Floods? Salinity issues? All those are the result of a dysfunctional water cycle. Take a look at this photo here, okay? This is just a county road separating these two fields. How come we have copious amounts of salinity here, very little here? It's totally management. When I tell you the history, this is a tilled monoculture system. This is a no-till system with cover crops and perennials added back into the system. That is 100% management there. We're seeing vast areas of the Northern Plains that have salinity issues. Back in my home state of North Dakota, this is problem number one. Why? Too much tillage in Eastern North Dakota, too much monocultures. Plain and simple. Who agrees with this? The amount of moisture one receives is irrelevant. I got a few takers, that's good. What is relevant is effective rainfall. Doesn't matter how much rainfall you get. I don't care whether we're talking about in a drought or in areas where there's too much moisture. Effective rainfall is the amount that can be infiltrated into the soil, moved throughout the soil profile, and then stored there to when the plant needs it. So I talk a lot about my neighbors. I don't have to worry, they're not here today, so I can talk about them. This neighbor is no-till, with the exception of this low spot. Every year for the last 35 years, I have watched this neighbor come and till this low spot. My family and I, we own the land right on the other side of the road here. We set up lawn chairs and watch him do it. It's entertaining as hell. Because what happens, he tills that, the next spring he'll get in there and get a crop seeded. We'll get a half inch of rainfall and that's what happens. 
He's combined two crops in 35 years off that low spot. In my mind, that's the definition of stupidity. Doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. You know, that's just ridiculous. I was gonna nominate him for a Ducks Unlimited Award for a wildlife habitat, you know? This is a photo I took off the front porch of my house, June 15, 2009. They were forecasting a major rainfall event. Started raining at about 5.30 in the evening. By the next morning, we'd had 13.6 inches of rain. Jay Fear came out and took this photo. I'm a little embarrassed. Colleen, you can see I got a little bare soil here, but it doesn't look too bad for 13.6 inches. There is quite a bit of slope going out here. Jay dug down. He made this comment. He says, you could have drove any implement or vehicle or want what, that you wanted across that field and not made a rut that morning after 13.6 inches of rain. This is the reason why. Look at that aggregation of that soil. Now this is the same fields that we te Jay tested at a half inch per hour is all they could infiltrate. Here's what we can infiltrate now. The, the scientists that were there doing those tests, an inch of water on my cropland fields. This is how long it takes to infiltrate. The answer is nine seconds. So where once we could only infiltrate a half of an inch an hour, we can infiltrate the first inch in nine seconds, the second inch in an additional 16 seconds. Two inches in 25 seconds. I've never, ever seen it rain that fast, right? So if you've got problems with compaction, salinity, drought, floods, look in the mirror. Go look in the mirror. You know, I just wonder. Now, yes, I'm not saying it'll alleviate it 100%. You know, the tragedy we had in the Central Plains with the flooding last spring, I'm not saying that could have been alleviated 100%, but think of the difference that could have been made if we'd have decent infiltration rates. Instead, what are people doing? Oh, I gotta go put in tile drainage. Why would anyone wanna write those checks rather than just, let's focus on the soil health? right? We have many of our clients who were considering putting in tile drainage after three years now of, of management with cover crops, building soil health, building soil aggregation, no need for that. I've come to the conclusion way too many farmers must have tax problems that they want that expense because it's simply a lack of management is the reason they need to do that. Too much or too little? If you have too much water, you need to increase your crop intensity. In other words, diversify your crop rotation, grow more cover crops. If you do not have enough water, you need to increase your water holding capacity. That means you need more carbon in the soil. The way to do that is through roots. Two thirds of your organic matter increase approximately will come from roots. You have to grow more covers. It's all about living plants, plain and simple. It's only going to happen with good soil aggregation and structure. You have to have high populations of mycorrhizal fungi and biology. Case in point, this is organic matter and available water holding capacity. So whether you have sand soils, silt loam, or clay soils. When I started, I was less than 2% organic matter, which means I could hold less than two inches of water in the top foot of the soil profile. Now I'm down here. Look, I can easily hold five or six inches. 2016, 17, and 18 were three very dry years in central North Dakota. We had 5.6, 8.2, and 11.6 inches of total precipitation for the year. I farmed all three years, raised profitable cash crops every year, grazed all my livestock every year without buying feed. This makes me resilient to drought. Resiliency, that's what it's about. The water cycle depends on plants. Okay, next one, how about poor fertility? If you're happy to put on copious amounts, and I'm gonna say nutrients, I'm not only talking about synthetics, I'm talking about organic amendments also, 
My question to you is this, what soil tests are you using? Soil tests used today claim that your soils lack fertility, but do they? How many of you have done total nutrient extraction tests on your farm or ranch? Good, got a few, that's great. So, total nutrient extraction is the soil's bank account. It looks at how much both organic and inorganic compounds you have in the soil. Now, part of my, our business, Understanding Ag, this past year, we tested 45 farms in the Northern Great Plains in Canada that are enrolled in a program uh, we're overseeing. We used total nutrient extraction. We measured in the top 12 inches. We just did the top 12 inches of the soil profile. Any guesses as to the amount of nitrogen average on 45 farms? Top 12 inches? 9,000 pounds. The lowest farm we tested was 4,000 pounds. Okay, is there a need for any one of those farms to add nitrogen? How about phosphorus? 2,300 pounds in the top 12 inches. Potassium. 11,000 pound average, okay? Now think of yourself, have you had to add any? I'll guarantee you your levels aren't gonna be a whole lot different. There'll, there'll be some. You've got plenty of nutrients. How about micronutrients? Look at this. Look at the micronutrients. 2,000 pounds of sulfur, 40,000 pounds of calcium. Look at iron. 60,000 pounds of iron just in the top 12 inches. Our soils are not deficient in iron. And yes, that is a pun I put up there purposely, okay? They are deficient in living roots and biology. That's the only difference between my farm and my neighbors. I have lived more living plants than they do a lot longer throughout the year. That makes biology available that drives the system. What we tested on 45 farms, there was no deficiencies. Why do we insist on applying fertilizer instead of focusing on having a living plant? Which would promote the biology we need to make those nutrients available. Now I wanna be clear about that. Total nutrient extraction is looking at the organic fraction and inorganic. The soil test your agronomist shown you it's simply showing you the inorganic fraction. What's water soluble today, it's not tied up with a carbon molecule, okay? You need the biology to break that bind and to cycle those nutrients. So what's the total of value of that? On those 45 farms, just the average, look at that, $3,600 worth of nitrogen, $1,100 worth of phosphorus. How much would be available in four feet, six feet, eight feet, 10 feet, how deep can the roots go in your soil? On our ranch, we're involved in a very intensive monitoring study of the carbon cycle. We've spent $170,000 to monitor carbon on 600 acres of land. This is a very extensive study. We took over 300 soil probes four feet deep. What we found is we did not probe near deep enough. It's an incomplete test because I have well aggregated soils now four feet deep. Roots are going down four feet in most of my fields. So now this next year, we're gonna add more money to it and go eight feet down and try that. Are you farming the top six inches of your soil? Or are you farming the top six feet? The choice is yours. Do we really need to be applying the amount of fertility we are Okay, are we holding it on our landscape or what's happening with it? Our soils are going down the watersheds, right? And when they do that, what goes with them? The nutrients, right? It's a proven fact that well over 50% of the nutrients you apply in any given year go down the watershed. They're not uptaken by that plant. What's that doing for water quality? And then we wonder why our urban cousins want to legislate to force us to do different management practices. 
Isn't it in our best interest to change that now? Okay, what about herbicides? Okay, I'm not picking on any particular herbicide, but I'll just use this as an example because it's the most common one used. This is glyphosate. Glyphosate's patented as a biocide. It will kill biology, okay? It's also patented as a chelator, meaning it will tie up heavy metals. So it kills the very biology that makes our nutrients available. And it ties up the very nutrients that the plants need to ward off diseases, pests. Take a look, those of you who are a little gray or worse like me, haven't we noticed the last 10, 20 years the, the increase in the use of fungicides? When I first started farming, there was very little fungicide being used. Now today, it's used like water. They're putting it on every year, multiple passes. Why is that? Now think of what's happening. What does a plant need to ward off fungal diseases? Manganese, zinc, iron, copper, right? Most of the heavy metals. What are we using as herbicides? A lot of them are chelators, tying them up, okay? Now, we got to pay attention to this because there's companies out there, both General Mills and Kellogg's, have announced that they are no longer, or in the future, they are restricting and not buying any crops that have had those applied at certain times. And you can bet they're going to expand that. Are you going to be ready for that? So my question to you is, what are all those inputs doing for our profit? <laughs> After those three years of hail and year of drought, that's what my bank account looked like. I tell people, we were so broke, the banker knew when we bought toilet paper. You know, that's pretty broke. Okay? This is out of Stats Canada, but look at this. The green down here is net farm profit. This is input cost. Okay? Why do we put up with that? Why do we put up with that? We are told that we need to produce more and more to feed the world, right? Hey, I'm feeding the world. I hear that all the time. So we focus on yields and we focus on pounds. But what does that lead to? What do higher and higher yields and pounds lead to? Lower and lower prices, higher subsidies, right? Do we think our urban cousins are going to put up with that for very long? Yeah, but Gabe, we got to feed the world. There's more and more people. Take a look at this. Current world population is about 7.2 billion people. 2018, how much food did we produce? Enough to feed how many people? 2017, we produced enough to feed 10.2 billion people. We are absolutely kidding ourselves if we think a growing population will cure low commodity prices. You know, we all remember 2012, 2011, 12, the drought, corn shot up, okay? What's happened to it since then? Just here a month ago, my business partners and I put on a workshop in Canada. I went back to 1970, 50 years prior, Corn and bean prices and wheat prices were higher 50 years ago than they are today. Yeah, boy, we got to produce more and more, right? What has all this production done for the quality of what we produce? Yes, we now produce plenty of food, but the nutrient density of that food has decreased anywhere from 15 to 65 percent. Average, 27 kinds of vegetables. Look at that percent decline in nutrient density. Here's meats. Look at that. Many people think, oh, I'm going to eat beef for the iron. Really? It's declined 54%. An individual today would have to consume twice as much meat, three times as much fruit, four times as many vegetables to get the same amount of minerals and trace elements as compared to 1940. The United States spends more on health care than any other country in the world, yet look at this. We now rank at the top or near the top in ADHD, ADD, cancers, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, autoimmune diseases, osteoporosis, and the list goes on. 
Are farmers and ranchers to blame for all of that? No. Are we to blame for some of it? Absolutely. We cannot have ecological integrity without human integrity. We all need to look in the mirror and do our part. So let's look at the big picture. Why do I spend so much time touting regenerative agriculture? There is no set definition of regenerative agriculture, but here's my definition. It's a renewal of food and farming systems which aims to regenerate topsoil, increase biodiversity, improve the mineral, carbon, and water cycles while improving profitability throughout the supply chain. And it's that last one that farmers and ranchers really get pushed out on. We don't think about the profitability. We don't think about the mental health aspects of what we do. No other industry has the ability to bring people together like does regenerative agriculture. You know, one of the things I'm seeing, and Jamie and I talked about this on the drive down here, is we're seeing many facets of society being brought together by regenerative agriculture. Why? Because regenerative agriculture has the ability to clean air. We can take large amounts of CO2 out of the atmosphere. We can clean our water cycle. Look at what's happening. Just here last week, I was on a conference call with the Great Lakes Environmental Fund. They're wondering how they can get involved to move regenerative agriculture forward in these states surrounding the Great Lakes. That's a good thing. We can address climate issues. Now, I happen to believe the climate's changing all the time, but there's no doubt that we have more CO2 in the atmosphere now than we used to. Remember what I said about the carbon in my soils? It was down to 1.7 to 1.9%. 75% of it had been released into the atmosphere. How are we going to get that back into the soil? The answer is up to us. We need diverse cash crops, cover crops, minimal disturbance. Following those principles, we need to integrate livestock. Those are all key. And when we do that, look at the change that can be had. This is a friend of mine in Canada. He wanted to know, does it make a difference if I move my livestock more than once a day or just move them every other day? This is one year, look at the difference in those soils. It's management, right? We can sequester more carbon due to our management. This is some work uh, my business partner, Dr. Alan Williams has done. This is carbon and CO2 equivalent from regenerative practices, rotational grazing, continuous grazing. Look at the difference in five years. That's huge. How can Gabe be so confident that these practices work? It's because I've lived them. I've seen it on my own farm. We've been able to regenerate soils. And we're doing this on farms all over the world. And when we do this and focus on our ecosystem, we can produce nutrient-dense food. And do not think for one moment that there's not a difference. <laughs> We're part of a project with Dr. Van Vliet at the Duke University Medical Center where we're actually measuring the compounds in both meats, grains, produce, all of those things. The, what we're seeing, the initial studies, it's absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing, the difference. For instance, we tested carrots, 2,000 times difference in some of the phytochemicals. 2,000 times. Not two, not 200, 2,000 times. So where's this all leading to? This is a bio-nutrient meter. It is our goal that within five years, every iPhone will have the ability to scan products for nutrient density. So any consumer will be able to walk up to any blueberry, any tomato, any cucumber, corn, wheat, doesn't matter, loaf of bread, scan that product, and they'll know the nutrient density of that product. Are you going to be ready for that? It's coming. This, this, is, this is the prototype. It's already been de developed. There's a, a, a big company in Israel and another one in Japan that have developed it. We're into the testing phase now. 
We've already tested lettuces, we've tested carrots, we've tested milk, we're testing all products. Where's this leading to? My firm has been contracted by General Mills. We're now testing their products. We're on 90 farms, Kansas, North Dakota, Manitoba, Saskatchewan. It looks like we're going to be doing a project in Indiana coming up where we're testing not only soil health, not only nutrients going into the watershed, but we're testing the nutrient density of what's being produced on those farms and ranches. Do you think for one moment that General Mills doesn't believe this is the future? Walk into their corporate office in Minneapolis. I was just there three weeks ago. Right on the wall, it says, the future of our business is regenerative agriculture. They've got that right on the wall. During the summer, when you walk from their parking lot up to their main office building, there's cover crops planted there with signs what those cover crops are. These businesses see that this is the difference. Why? Because consumers are demanding it. So where are you going to be? Are you going to be selling at the top tier, bottom tier? General Mills in their organic division has set up these practices. They're, it's a self-assessment. They put their producers in three different tiers based on are they growing cover crops? What's the diversity of their cash crops? Are they zero tilling? Do they have armor on the soil surface? Are they integrating livestock? They're keeping track of this and they want to source their products from those that are moving down the regenerative path. Are you going to be ready for that? That's the future of agriculture. I spend several hours every day literally talking to these companies that are demanding this. We have been contacted by the majority of large food companies in the United States and overseas about regenerative practices and where they'll lead us. And this is the reason we need to focus on that. It's for future generations. You know, my generation has unfortunately taken this soil ecosystem in the wrong direction. It's up to us to regenerate it, move it back. So I, I just simply say this to you, your farm, your ranch is a direct reflection of you. Make with it what you want, but trust me, you can convert dirt to soil. With that, I have time for a few questions. On time, Colleen, I told you I would be. Well, questions? I went through an awful lot, yes. So the corn that you had seeded um, with the cover crop in it, mm -hmm. how do you get corn established without uh, killing yep. the, the cover crop and then how you yep. seed it? You seed yep. it at the same time? So how do you establish corn into a living cover? There's several ways to do that. How I do it is we plant our corn and then three days later I seed the cover crop, okay? That's how I'm doing it because I'm not using herbicides. If you're using a herbicide, it's pretty easy. You go in there and you, you plant, uh, you no-till into a living cover, use a herbicide. Like with uh, winter triticale or cereal rye, hairy vetch, if you go in there into that living fall biannual, plant your corn, hit it with a light application, you're only gonna make the hairy vetch sick. It won't terminate it. Then corn gets up established and then the uh, uh, vetch comes back to life. In a no-till situation and organic where you're not using herbicides, then it's plant your corn, wait three to five days, seed the cover crop. I only recommend you doing that though if you have good soil health, good bacterial fungal ratios and biology. Otherwise, weeds are gonna come and bite you. Yes, follow what, up. What are you putting ahead of that? What? What's the... Yeah, you saw the, what am I putting ahead of that? You saw the thick residue that I'm planting into? That was a warm season cover crop mix, grazed by livestock, terminated by winter. Every location has what I call its unfair advantages. Us in the Northern Plains here, our unfair advantages, we get winter. Winter will terminate those things. Plant species that winter will terminate. Question back there. You, all these seed companies, everybody tells you that having a cover crop growing prior to V5, V7, and a corn crop is detrimental to yield. How are you, are you having any issues with that or no? Yeah, having a cover crop growing prior to 
to V5 through V7 is detrimental to yield. They are correct, okay? But realize by V4, V5, your maximum yield potential has been set. So the key is though, I'm seeding that just slightly delayed from the corn. I give the corn, you know, five days head start about the most. And so I'm not seeing that big yield drag. It's not like I'm planting into a cover crop that's already established. That's the difference. Plus, you gotta remember, you're talking yield, I'm talking profit. That's two totally different things. Yes? All of your cover crops that you're planting in front of your corn, does it lunar kill? Yes. Uh, the, the cover crops in front of the corn, are they winter killed? Yes, now that I'm not using a herbicide. If you're using herbicides, then plant into a living cover and terminate them immediately after you plant. How long after I plant? Yeah, how long after? That, that all depends on context, how much moisture, what's the soil temp at, etc. You know, one of the issues we see with corn production People have totally forgotten that corn's a warm season grass. For crying out loud, they're trying to plant it when it's snowing still. It's ridiculous. Wait till soil temps are 55 degrees. Yes, another question. I'm assuming your neighbors are watching what you're doing. And you had your comparative soil. Mm -hmm. and I'm assuming your crops are also similar or this similar that you can see a difference. Have they asked you for your advice? Yeah, have neighbors asked me for advice? Okay, the one neighbor I talk about right across the road we get along fine, but he's been up my driveway once in 35 years, okay? Once, he got stuck and he had to walk up and ask me to come pull him out. <laughs> he sees the bus loads of people all the time, he just doesn't care. Now, the county I'm in, Burley County, North Dakota, to my knowledge in 94, I was the first true 100% no-tiller in our county. Now our county is 75 to 80% no-till. That was adapted, adopted very readily but they're not doing the livestock integration. Like most places, livestock have kind of left the environment there. So they're just doing monocultures. You gotta realize, people always ask, what's holding people back? Number one is fear, fear of the unknown. Number two, in my belief, hands down, is the federal farm program. Revenue insurance is one of the most antagonistic things there is on the regenerative practice because in regenerative agriculture, you have to have the power to observe and make decisions based on it. We've had a real battle over the last five years, adopt and allow cover crops to be seeded within so many days of planting a cash crop. And they're still not fully on board. So let's face it, 95 plus percent of planting decisions are based off revenue insurance. Yet I didn't put it in this presentation today, uh, Dr. John Lundgren did a study, and General Mills, this will be in what we're working on with the 90 farms, we're tracking profitability. Regenerative farms were 78% higher profitability. 78%. That's huge. The reason my neighbors don't see that is they don't look at my bank account. Plain and simple. You know? Yes. Do you have to have a cropping system to improve the soil? Can you do it when you're having do you have to have a cropping system? Can you do it with perennials? You can do it much, much easier and faster with perennials and grazing animals. Perennials and grazing animals, it's all about timing. It's about stock density and recovery time. Mimic the bison and what they were doing. We can improve. I, I didn't put it in this presentation because I knew I wouldn't be talking to a large number of livestock producers. One of our consultants, Alejandro Carrillo, in the Chihuahua Desert, six to eight inches total annual rainfall. We were on Alejandro's place. You drive through 60 miles of desert, and then you open the gates, and it looks like you're in a totally different world. You got forage up to here, and just green as can be, and you cross that gate, and you're in a desert. It's all management. Yes? Who's the decision over a field that's been conventional farms? Um, Yep. And what do you do to taking over conventionally farm that has a lot of herbicide resistant weeds? And that's context. Do you have livestock available? Okay. You have livestock available. We can use the livestock. It depends. 
do you want to convert that into perennial grazing or do you want to keep it in a cropping system? You know, that's up to you. Once we determine the context, that will determine our approach. Usually what we do in those situations is, I would ask the question, has it been no-tilled or has it been tilled? tilled. If it's been tilled, you can till it once more, realize you, if you need to smooth it out of that, realize you're just gonna plant more seeds. But with that tillage plant, uh, pass, plant a very diverse cover crop mix, graze that with livestock in order to convert that to cash. That will start the process. Do you till it? The first time, I'm not saying I'd have to see it, okay. but that's one of your options. Okay. It's all about context. Every place is a little different. Thank you. No? Yes? Well, I'm probably the only person in the room feeling a little overwhelmed. So <laughs> if you could pick one or two items, I know you've stated, but if you could restate it for the people in here that are corn, soybean rotation, chemistry, yep. fertility that's applied, one or two items. Yep. That, you know what, guys? I don't know everyone's specific situation, yep. but here's the biggest thing. Yep. you got to start somewhere. Okay, corn, soybean. Corn soybean producers in a conventional quote unquote system. Okay. Depends if they're no till or not. The first thing we got to eliminate as much as possible the tillage. Now, I'm not saying sell, you know, go change your equipment. That might not re make, re make your financial context, you know. So that's the first thing we got to eliminate the tillage. David Brandt, good friend of mine who's chairman of our Soil Health Academy, board of directors. He says the number one he, thing he did was went no-till, added wheat to his rotation. And the wheat to his rotation, obviously wheat is not that profitable, but that allowed him the window of time to grow a longer season cover. You're kind of farting in a thunderstorm if you think planting a cover following corn or soybeans is going to capture enough solar energy to fuel the next year's crop. Not going to happen. You've got to have diverse covers for a lot longer period. That's why you diversify the crop rotation. So no-till, diversify that rotation for the reason, even if it's diversified enough to get a, a full season cover in it, that, that's just key. Yes? Yeah, for, for any of those uh, perennial species, blueberries, etc. Yes, you work between the rows with perennials. We were doing a large project on apple orchards down in the Chihuahuan Desert, and they were killing everything between the rows. We simply went in there, planted diverse covers. Now we have sheep grazing in there, increased their profitability because it decreased their input costs. They no longer have to spray for pests, and that plus it's improved their water infiltration, and down there, obviously, it's all irrigated, you know? No, we, well, that's going to be context, too. I never recommend a monoculture of legumes. We're seeing as much damage being done uh, with overuse of legumes. Look at natural systems are low in legume percentages. You don't want a lot of legumes in the, in the system, just some. It'll be diversity but it'll be diversity mainly of your grasses and forbs. Yeah? Yes? What are your established yields for corn and other crops on your farm? Yeah, and what I'll do is I'll compare it to county average. Established yields was the question. So how do we compare? County average for corn in Burley County is 98 bushels an acre. My proven long-term uh, yield is 127, okay? County average for oats, is 62. My proven long-term average is 112. Okay, and for wheat county average is 40. Mine 62. So I'm significantly higher. Am I the highest? No. Am I the most profitable? Yeah, I'm willing to bet I'm close. Yeah. So that's what it's about. How often am I happen to lime? <laughs> never. I've never limed. I never consider it. And with our clients. I'm not going to say we will never, but right now we're consulting on over 17 million acres across North America. We have yet to once recommend lime. Do the math. You're, you're absolutely kidding yourself if you think applying a ton or two of lime is going to change things. 
it, I, sh I just showed you the amount of calcium that's available that, that excuse me, is in the total nutrient extraction. That there's absolutely very, very little reason to ever lime. We haven't ran into it yet on 17 million acres, so, yes. Really? But I'd like to say to Are you single? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's my friend. <laughs> first, I'd like to say to all the growers and stuff here, I heard him first maybe five or six years ago in Omaha, Nebraska. It was Greek to knew about Africa. You came up and asked me a question. Here. <laughs> I remember that. Always. Um, then uh, this spring, I got to go to Brown's Ranch. It was awesome. But anyway, every time you learn something, and each time I'm going to follow him everywhere I can, but it's real, and I dirt to soil, but read everything. I'm a blueberry farmer, and with anything you're trying to do, learn from the people who are doing it, but also read in your off season, read everything you can about it. Um, I've started doing NRCS or whatever, but just read everything and keep up with how it's changing. And I know with smaller growers, you know, you just have to take it, experience it, try a little bit at a time. I'm doing a little bit, and then I did cheat. I do have a vermiculture thing on my farm, but I'm just learning as I go, and I do believe that it's possible to change the way you farm. Thank you, and I didn't even pay her for that, Colleen. <laughs> well, thank you. With that, my time is up. I'll be around all day, though. So feel free to come up and ask me questions. Uh, thank you so much, Gabe. That was wonderful. I hope everyone's brain isn't mushy, because we're going to continue this show.